Well, greetings, investors. Welcome to our 12th Annual Roundtable Awards, our monthly webcast. This one for February 2022. It's actually our second one in February this time because of the vagaries of the calendar, and we're actually holding it in March. And the next roundtable will also be in March, so we'll get a double dip in March. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and I do want to welcome you to our red carpet black tie uh, celebration where we go back and take a look at some of the selections made over the last year and the, the 12 years that we've been doing this. And before we get started, I just want to go down and talk about uh, some wonderful investing educators who just love to share their thoughts and ideas. Starting with upper left, that's Kim Butcher. She's originally from Indiana, temporarily on loan, I believe, to uh, Florida, where she is living uh, near her mother to help out with that situation. And she is renowned for her presentations at the national conventions and uh, a variety of things. Good evening, Kim. She probably muted herself. I would continue, Mark. Uh, she's not muted, but uh, she's maybe with her. She's maybe had to step away. So, away. Uh, well, that voice you hear is Ken Cavula, the guy with the horn there. He's our uh, celebrated raconteur of investing. Good evening, Ken. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, everybody. We're so glad to have a nice audience this evening, and I'm so happy to have our uh, our panel together tonight. It's it's always nice to be with you inside, but it's especially nice to have some of the other folks join us. The guy at the top in the middle is Herb Lemkul. He is neck deep in beads. Herb splits his time between Traverse City, Michigan, and the central area of Florida. Welcome, Herb. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I really appreciate it. The guy wearing the crown, and that's not simply for the, his uh, baseball team, but uh, that is Cy Lynch. He is a renowned educator and uh, a charter member of the roundtable. Good evening, Mr. Lynch. Good evening, Mark, Ken, and everybody. It's uh, good to be king, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, Ken reminded me earlier. So Enjoy it, Cy, because everybody will be gunning for you now, okay? Just, <laughs> I, I feel the target on my back. Just remember <laughs> that can, can often be a fleeting condition. <laughs> All right, and next on our list is Susan Michalik. Susan is a, a longtime volunteer and, and works a lot with investors. She's also one of the champions of the Bower City Ladies, one of the top performing uh, women's clubs in southern South Central Wisconsin, and uh, quite a track record as an investor, and they've, they're just knocking it out of the park. Welcome, Susan. I don't know if she's got uh, audio or not. I do. I do. Thank you very much. Nice to be here tonight. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. All right, Ann Manning from Houston is also a, a, a former champion of our Groundhog Challenge and has been a, a contributing guest damsel. I don't think she's with us yet, Ken, so. I was just double checking. Ann's not here yet, no. Uh -uh. I'll chime in if she can. Um, again, as, as uh, Ken was mentioning in the green room, Hugh's vocational activities are really stretching him. Uh, to all corners of the earth and all time zones, and he's unable to join us here tonight, but he does send his best regards and would like to remind everybody that St. Patrick's Day is this month. <laughs> and last but not least, on the far right there, Matt Spielman, a wonderful contributor to our programs here at the, the round table and contributor for Bull Sessions recently. And uh, again, just a, a real asset to us as a community of investors. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. All right, so let's go ahead and get underway. We do have a whole bunch on the program, so we'll try to step kind of lively through this stuff. Here's your boilerplate reminder that no investment recommendation is intended. This is about education. It is about the demonstration of some principles, philosophies, methods, and techniques that have been in the works, uh, helping us to be successful investors for more than eight decades now. Uh, it's championed by the Modern Investment Club movement via NEIC Better Investing and or Manifest Investing. You're going to hear opinions from us tonight. Please do your own homework. 
We do try to disclose when we hold things in our personal portfolios. Try to remember to do that anyhow. If you'd like to have a reminder about these types of events, send an email to ncavola1 at comcast.net. If you'd like copies of the slides or if you have feedback or follow-up questions, that is my email address, markr at manifestinvesting.com. Please reach out if you need to. Here's our quick agenda for this evening. Uh, again, welcome. If you're new here, we do try to keep it fairly informal. As Ken mentioned, we sometimes will field questions. Tonight's not one of those nights because we do have quite a full agenda, but we do stick around for a Q&A as it says down there at the bottom. Um, but welcome and uh, welcome back to all the familiar names and faces that we see in the attendance roles also. We will go through and talk about our Golden Knight statues here in a minute. We'll take, talk about our performance results. Won't have any hot, hot seat stocks tonight, just due to the nature of the program. And frankly, we don't have any. Uh, you can see the six stock presentations that we'll be doing. A couple of them will be fairly quick, as Ken has already warned you, because they're re repeat selections. And uh, we do have a couple of new selections on there, and we'll get to those. We do an audience poll at the end. So you'll get to actually vote, even if you're here for the first time, vote for the company of your choosing. And uh, I'm not sure it's all that likely that we'll have time for Q&A, but if we do, we will make time. Um, any other comments there, Ken? Yeah, is Cy going to be talking about EPAM a little bit, about what's happening there? Yeah, that'll come up. Uh, we've had quite a quite a dive down. That's that's the one stock that actually has had the most impact in the in the portfolio. So we'll ask him for a few comments on that. Good, thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Just as a reminder, we've been doing this monthly since July 2010. Uh, we just simply want to take and share an idea and the study of that idea with the audience. Uh, we do uh, encourage less traditional stocks, referred to as non-core selections. We do try to build a portfolio, and we do keep track. We want to beat the Wilshire 5,000 by five percentage points, and we'd like to see the majority of our selections actually outperform the index. So that's what we've been doing uh, for, again, nearly 12 years. Here's our actual results. This is really what matters. The stuff that you're about to see is what adds up to this. Um, that red dotted line across the middle is that five percentage point advantage to the market. Think of this as a chart of time versus how much did we beat the market by on the y-axis. And again, we're aiming to beat it by five. To date, we've actually checked in at 17.2%. Uh, that's the actual return, the absolute return, 172 during a period when the market doing mirroring investments did 12.5%. So you can see we're actually back to pretty close to that 5% target. We were above it for quite some time. We'd like to return. Over half of our picks have outperformed from the time of selection. So things are going pretty good. We'll come back to this and, and reinforce. Any thoughts? Ka-ching. Ka-ching. All right, let's go ahead and press on. We're going to start with the pro with the program uh, and basically present the awards. So welcome to the Golden Golden Knight Awards. Mark, and if you'd like to welcome Ann to the group, she is here and in the back room right now. Uh, Ann, you're muted, but if you'd like to unmute and just say hi to the audience, we'd we'd love to have you do that. And we're so happy you're able to make it with us. Good evening, Ann. She's the one on the lower left there. Hope you all are doing well. Well, she's unmuted, but we're not hearing anything. So let's continue, Mark, okay? Okay. All right, here's the awards we're gonna cover here over the next couple of minutes. We do best selection for the year, the year being 2021, best selection all time. And then we also look at accuracy. That's whether the pick outperformed the market after it was selected both for the year and for all time. We do have a category, a special category for storytelling and case studies and that sort of thing, the best picture. And then the coveted awards for best annual performance, that's for actual rate of return or relative return by our participants, guests and damsels. And then last but not least, the best all-time performance, that would be the all-time since inception performance 
on a return basis. So here's the first award. And this is kind of awkward because, you know, uh, when, uh, when the scorekeeper actually ends up winning the, the event uh, or the award, it's, it's kind of awkward. And for 2021, Activision Blizzard won my selection for just a few months ago. Uh, November 2021 is actually the leading performer over the last year. We go back, we generally go back to the trailing Thanksgiving to get these results. And you can see that uh, I and that guy in Omaha, actually hit one of his lieutenants, actually picked Activision Blizzard, which I believe is supposed to be taken out at approximately $90 by Microsoft. And any way that it can happen, I'll take it. The other thing that I really like about this is notice the potpourri, the smorgasbord of selection people on this one. Virtually everybody's had a hand in this one over the years. It's amazing what the date does to you. This was done as of uh... March 1st, or no, it's February 28th, right, Mark? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and did you see what Lockheed Martin closed at today? No, I did not. Oh, I think it was 452. <laughs> really? Day late and a dollar short. Things, things <laughs> happen <laughs> pretty volatile, yeah. Of course, Axos and Regeneron were very good to us. Uh, Herbs, NVIDIA. Pretty good over the last year. Those banking stocks kicked into gear, Ken, and they actually served us pretty well. All right, so let's move on to the second award. And this one is the best selection all time. And, and basically, it's just going back and you know checking the logs to see you know what has been the best all-time performing selection. I put the last two years in here just to give you a feel for what this looks like. The, the ones that are yellowed out are actually closed out positions. And you can see there's a number of closed out positions over the last couple of years. But you're, what, you're, what we did experience this year, uh, our Delix uh, put quite a hit on us. And it actually has disappeared from the leaderboard. And uh, just wanted you to get a feel for the general size of, you know, look at, look at some of these numbers for relative returns. Going back over the last year or so. There's some uh, names that are on this list that are definitely not uh, household names, but very important. Simulations Plus is on, on there, five below. Uh, some some names that are a little bit off the off the beaten path a little bit. We like that. Okay, and now uh, it's it's getting a little awkward because Universal Display actually did hang on to the all time best selection position for the second year in a row. It's the first time that's happened. Um, don't worry, I'm, I'm done winning awards or just about anyhow. Um, notice that uh, the caption is from uh, Two Guys Talk Stock. Ken Kavul is not pictured. A little bit of retaliation there for <laughs> my St. Louis experience. Um, Boy, you carry a grudge for a long <laughs> time, Mark. <laughs> but again, this one's been pretty distributed, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, the challenging market of this year. But as you look down that list, I mean, look at some of those names. You know, from community favorites and household names to some that are a little bit less so. So, all right, so I'm while I'm dusting off some room on my trophy uh, mantle here, we'll move on to the accuracy of selections. And uh, here we have our, our first Cy Lynch of the evening. Cy Lynch had the best accuracy for the selections he made over the last year. Uh, actually coming in with six out of nine, beating the market. So he's joined that list. He's actually been on quite a tear for the last few years. And uh, long-term, Hugh McManus still has the, the, the all-time accuracy all time. Herb is really up there. I'm looking forward to see how Herb does this year. We need to have Herb involved. Herb, I, I gave him the lighter fluid uh, moniker there. And what does that come from? I, I just figured we've got all those Enfuegos up at the top that you, we needed you to have a, a good uh, ignition source there. No problem. 
Sai, you noticed that he called me on Fuego in 2013, and I haven't made the list since. So. <laughs> I, see I see that. Well, you, so. you, you got to pass the sunscreen while you're in the in the spot. <laughs> yeah, and I, I haven't been back since I had it either, so there you go. All right. Another category that we do like to sub celebrate a little bit is the one which seems to resonate with the community. And I promise you, this is the last one where my name appears. Um, these programs, as you go back and if you search the archives of Manifest, and just there's just some powerful, good programs, you know, going back to Hughes, Moore, Spock, Les Kirk. Then there's that infamous Chinese pulled pork program from 2010. Matt Spielman's Stroll Across the Parking Lot, that was a great session on the origins of air lease. And again, from top to bottom here, Hugh McManus's FDA Pipelines, uh, he's actually done a couple of those, are extremely well received by the audience. Um, our decade in review as we celebrated our first 10 years of Roundtable a year ago is pretty good. And Ken and I do thoroughly enjoy, it's one of the things that we have done together for a number of years, thoroughly enjoy picking those best small companies around Halloween and uh, pretty well attended and pretty well followed by our community. All right. Any other thoughts on that, Ken? Nope. Uh, I'm uh, so far. I'm, I'm not seeing any real surprises in in what's going on. Uh, we've had some very interesting picks this year, and we've been kind of erratic in our in our performance. Uh, kind of a uh, I'll use the term that I've heard on TV a lot. Kind of a barbell approach. Uh, we haven't had too many midland choices. We've had a lot of good ones and a lot of really bad ones. Not too much in between. Yeah, that's kind of typical for most years. We have beaten the market for seven years running, and I'm knocking on wood because don't want to jinx that. All right, continuing on with the awards. Here is the the best annual performance and. Uh, and Cy, si, I believe you were speculating that maybe the the problems with EPAM might have caused you some problems here. And I think that, that probably could have been the case, both here and in the next column. But uh, EPAM actually did put a pretty good dent. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, we might have a new category of the biggest uh, crash and burn. <laughs> and I could have won a month ago, won the biggest return, and this month the biggest crash and burn. I got a few to challenge you on those, though, Si. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Fuego's on there, too. Um, but, but again, Hugh, we wish you could be with us more often. Uh, I mean, he does pick some unusual stocks along the way but you know here's a case where bp came home to roost amgen has done fairly well and in a year that was fairly challenging he did manage to, to um, barely edge outside for this one Sai was in the running for a, a second consecutive one here all right and here's our all-time leader uh Sai has had a number of good years in a row, and, and I, I think uh, his approach to investing, as I've watched him over the years, is, is really tortoise-like, and I mean that in the most respectful way possible. And it's, it's really kind of fascinating to see uh, the long-term results percolating, and he, like I say, he's had two or three spectacular years. And uh, that, is, uh, that is not Photoshopped. He actually was on home plate at Atlanta Stadium. So, Sai, si, we'll let you tell us a little bit about that and just investing in general. Um, congratulations. Well, thank you. And and I will take tortoise-like as, as, as a compliment because, as we all know, uh, I do preach patience, and we, we need to, to watch, watch that. And in some ways, uh, I guess another uh, in the last month, really, the last couple of weeks, uh, an example, perhaps, of of a, a barnstormer uh, turning down and uh, something that's bounced around a bit, uh, uh, but certainly an example of patience is the cognizant. Um, again, I guess I would win the most selected award probably for cognizant. Um, but again, about a month ago, cognizant had uh, uh, done quite well, and it's been hit relatively hard. Um, uh, in the last uh, last month, and hopefully can turn around. 
um, you know, uh, but the uh, my experience there uh, in uh, that I get that was Turner Field, as I recall, which is uh, the previous Braves Stadium. Uh, I uh, was selected as the uh, season ticket holder of the night and got to uh, uh, go down and uh, deliver the lineup card and meet the uh, opposing uh, managers and the umpires and get my picture taken. So that was was quite a blast uh, doing that. So I'm glad that you brought that out and gave me good memories. And I'll hush now so we can get on with the great presentations of next year's winners. Okay. That we'll and you, you need to get back to work convincing our baseball players to return from whatever it is they're doing. These days. Oh, man. Yes, I'm not happy on that. But like I said, I'll keep my mouth shut so we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, congratulations. Thank you. Right. Here's our Fat Tuesday moment. Let the good times roll. Those are punchkis for those of you that are familiar with that tradition, here, at least here in the upper Midwest. And again, here's just our reminder of uh, how the performance has gone over the years. It's actually been showing signs of life here the last uh, a few months. Here's the actual portfolio. These are the top 20 holdings in the portfolio, the tracking portfolio. And uh, you can actually access the entire portfolio, which is, oh, I'd say approximately 70 positions um, using that public link. The way that you read this list is anytime that uh, a stock is presented by either a knight or a damsel or selected by the audience, we invest $1,000 into it. So in this case, Microsoft appears up here in this list uh, as being selected five times. That means five th a total of $5,000 has been invested in Microsoft. That $5,000 has grown to become that number. So that's actually pretty special. Uh, as I was just talking about Cognizant uh, putting in a few strong days, uh, EPAM was third, and you can see that they've actually dropped down here. But from top to bottom, you can basically decode that and see uh, what type of companies have been selected. Again, quite a few, what most people would consider blue chip core holdings, but there are a few. Uh, we, did, uh, we did sell Apple, otherwise that would have been up there too. Yes. You pulled the trigger on it too fast. Probably did, yep. We were certainly got into it at the right time. Yep. As we'll see. But Costco is a single time selection that's now worth nearly eleven thousand uh, dollars. Good good clean fun all around. So that's how you can actually take a look at that. Um again with a number of repeats showing up at the top. We really don't have any decisions to make with respect to selling or divesting here tonight. The portfolio is in pretty decent shape, decent par could be a little bit higher. We continue to hope for uh adding good uh, return candidates to it and we're keeping that number up quality is good growth is good could be a tiny bit higher the companies with the lowest return forecasts are all pretty much core holdings blue chip companies and we wouldn't sell them unless we needed to improve the portfolio well, the only reason for selling them unilaterally on a case by case would be if their projected annual return basically went sub-zero or less than money market rates we do have a few companies misbehaving that uh, we're keeping an eye on, and there are no red hot selections with the exception of Lockheed Martin. There's your price there, Kim. Yeah. Wow. That's up like 10% in a day. So really no selling decisions. What we did talk about, uh, maybe we can give a little bit of background on what's going here, uh, either Ken or Cy or anybody that's taking a closer look. What are your thoughts on uh, the problems at EPAM side. There we go. Need to unmute uh, myself. I, I think it's one of those situations that we're just going to have to uh, uh, watch and see how things shake out. Um, normally, it's the sort of situation that I would uh, say is market overreaction to an immediate event. Uh, probably if, and, and let me, for those of you who don't know, uh, let me mention, uh, really there's two major issues with EPAM relating uh, or arising from the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and that unrest. Um, 
Russia accounts for about 4%, uh, as I understand it, of revenues for EPAM. That, I think, would definitely be an overreaction, e even if those revenues went away and um, you know, there was some concern over uh, Eastern European connection or, or just some broken relationships. Uh, I think the, the stock fall is way overblown. The bigger problem is that much of EPAM's workforce, their actual programmers and uh, computer operators are um, Eastern European and in particular Ukraine. So right now the company is in the uh, process of trying to evacuate uh, their workers from Ukraine or ship them to safer areas. The company issued a press release on that yesterday uh, and withdrew their guidance. So really until that is um, you know, worked out and handled, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen to the, to the company because of course their ability to work is, is drastically impacted. But I think, again, long range is going to turn around. It's just a matter of uh, what's going to be the near term impact and how bad. So if, if you were thinking about this as a terminal versus temporary condition, what type, what's the main perspective you would have on? I, I, I would still, I would still um, uh, lean, lean mostly, mostly temporary because they, they do have the Ukrainian workforce and that I think is, is a major issue, but that's not where all their, their employees are. And they've already started trying to hire in their other service centers throughout the world. What, where I wanted to come at it from, Mark, uh, is uh, a lesson that, that I learned uh, a lot of years ago and that I think that newer investors need to learn. And that's when when a, a stock is down 35, 40, and in EPAM's case, it was down 45% uh, when it closed, uh, I think, two days ago. Uh, the time to sell it is not at that point. And the time, <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna sell it, uh, you know, wait a week, give it a week, give it two weeks even, because most of these stocks that take those precipitous drops do have a little bit of bounce back. I noticed today that EPAM was uh, up somewhere between seven and eight percent, uh, and you know, in an investment, seven or eight percent is a significant amount. So that uh, uh, if you would have been a little bit patient, if you wanted to get out, uh, maybe it was better to get out 8% uh, uh, higher than it was two days ago. Uh, uh, you know, most of the damage is done when it, when it makes that kind of a, a downward movement and to get with your broker and put it on sale the minute the market opens the very next day, I think is, is the exact opposite kind of thing to do when you're managing a portfolio. Uh, I've seen this happen to stocks, uh, not often, thank goodness, that I happen to own, but often enough uh, that I, I just, I just can't. I can't try to be nimble. There's no nimbleness there anymore when that happens. Right. And you just have to sit back and, and have that patience that Cy was talking about. And I like to add to the word patience. I like to add the word discipline as well. It takes a little discipline to sit there on your hands when you've lost a lot of money, but uh, that money's not coming back immediately. And maybe there's a big enough bounce that it's worth waiting a, a week or so. No, um, I think that's good. I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Ken? No, you didn't. Go, go, uh, side. Uh, go. go. Uh, I just want to mention one quick thing because this chart uh, illustrates it perfectly. For those of you who maybe have heard that stop losses are a good idea to keep you protected from this sort of thing, uh, understand you might have sold out uh, on that first drop uh, that you see the the um, uh, drop down to about 504 you might have gotten out around 504 and so so if you're if your stop loss was somewhere between the uh, 650 or whatever it was and that 504 you may have gotten executed out at around the 504 however if if let's say your stop loss was at 500 you may well have sold out at that 211 that Ken was just talking about 
<laughs> there is no what happens with a stop loss is when the price crosses your stop price the order becomes a market order and when all heck is breaking loose like happened here you may very well sell at the bottom uh i, I there was a uh a plane crash with uh oh shoot i can't remember the former name but uh was airtran no i guess airtran was the the it former was airtran name. that was yes, the former yes. name right yes yeah. that was the former name airtran airlines and uh, i had some clubs that asked me that question they had stop losses and they sold out at the very bottom and said what happened and what happened was the market bottom dropped out and there weren't enough buyers to buy at their price, so they sold at the very bottom. That last sentence, I, is your key that I, a, a lot of folks that are in the stock market forget that it's a market. And in order to sell, you have to have somebody that's going to buy. And if the buyers all dry up because of a, of a, uh, a geopolitical event like we're seeing right now in the Ukraine, then uh, you're not going to sell that stock at any price until somebody steps in and says, okay, I'll take a chance on it. And there's not a lot of them sometimes to do that. Yeah. I think this one may, I don't know the answer to this, but I think this one may have also moved quite a bit after hours. So it would be interesting to look at that also. There's no protection against that, obviously. Or at least it's a, it's a different playing field. All right, so I'm showing nine o'clock. Let's go ahead and get on with our stock presentations. And I actually, we've got Sai's attention. Let's go ahead and keep it as he uh, doubles down on his selection of MKS instruments. Take it away, Sai. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, I'll just start off by saying uh, this is a repeat selection, as we've already said, and I'll try to move uh, relatively quickly through through the presentation. I've got about sixteen slides. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but uh, I wanted them in the deck so that those of you who want to look a little bit further, um, either because you don't know the company at all, or I'm going to give you a couple of updates of new news on the company. If you wanted to dig deeper, you'll have the chance to. Here you can see sales growth pretty consistent over the last 10 years, a little bit of uh, up and down, but re remember that MKSI uh, is a supplier to semiconductor manufacturers. Semiconductor is a, quite a volatile um, industry, not necessarily in accordance with normal business cycles, but the semiconductor business cycle. So you're going to see some ups and downs. The um, earnings per share line disconnects from sales a little bit, uh, both again because of the cyclical nature of the business, but also because uh, some of that is due to acquisition expenses because again remember these are as reported earnings and not uh continuing operations or normalized earnings that morningstar uses uh next slide just quickly where i uh, got uh mksi today um i just ranked the portfolio said let's take a look at what's in the portfolio that might be interesting and uh so the stocks ranked by uh Projected return, uh, Google or Alphabet uh, looks interesting. You'll hear more about that later on. Uh, but of the companies I felt pretty comfortable with and that I follow, MKSI uh, was high. And so I said, let's check it out. Next slide. Um, a quick industry study uh, you see uh, with um, the PAR uh, or ranked by quality, MKSI. Uh, has the third highest quality or actually tied for second and also has the highest uh, par in the industry. So it's a good return for excellent quality company in the industry. Next slide. Uh, and then I went ahead and did a uh, next step just to see, is there anything else in the manifest database that tracks um, MKS um, attributes or metrics? And I used par went a little under the 17% at 16 and a half. Uh, quality, I went ahead and did ex still very excellent at 90 versus the 98 and a 90 financial strength. And here you see the companies. Uh, if I'd wanted a new company, Lamb Research, which notice is a semiconductor uh, company as well, um, or equipment manufacturer um, is possible. And again, you already saw Alphabet in the previous slide. Next slide. 
So here's uh, what MKSI does. Uh, this is what Value Line does. They started out as a supplier to semiconductor manufacturers, basically um, instruments and uh, items to control gases used in the semiconductor manufacture process. That's their core. That was their business up, uh, pretty much their exclusive business up until about uh, 2015, 2016. And then they started expanding some of that uh, technical expertise into uh, manufacturers uh, of fiber optics and uh, lasers in particular that you can see here. Uh, and so that they call that second category their advanced uh, technology. Next slide. Uh, here's some of the uh, products that they um, manufacture. Again, measuring gases is their core product, and then they're branching out from that. Next slide. This is the company's uh, description of itself and what they do. Uh, what you see in there, and this is from a presentation, you can go to the MKSI uh, website and uh, look for their investor presentation. They update it about every six months and you can um, uh, take a look at it. Most of the rest of the slides, except for my uh, judgments at the end, are from that present, the most current presentation. And you'll see what they're really uh, keying on now is how all of the semiconductors and similar high-tech components are uh, being miniaturized, getting smaller, and how that makes the processes um, more technical and uh, they feel they're a leader in being able to address that. Next slide. I mentioned the semiconductor business and the advanced market business. You see uh, the revenue breakdown about 60-40 and then uh, some more detail if you wanna take a look at what's involved in each of those areas. Next slide. Uh, here's the financial results. Remember I mentioned 2015 was about when they started moving out of uh, exclusively semiconductors into what they call the advanced markets. Uh, and they seek to be leaders in their uh, field. I particularly like that uh, line that you see about um, the middle of this chart, leading product categories. That's where they rank either first or second in market share uh, by their estimation. And notice how they're up to 16 markets uh, at by the end of fiscal 2021 in their estimates. Next slide. Uh, here's uh, just the semiconductor, what the company has done historically. Um, they have outperformed the uh, WFE, the Wafer Fabrication Index. That's an index for um, semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, they've outperformed that. Um, over the last, um, I think it's about eight years that they show in their charts, and they have grown that the delta between the WFE and their semiconductor growth has increased over the last few years. So they're round, soundly capturing more of the potential market there in semiconductors. And then here's the company's view of the advanced markets, which again is based largely on laser. Uh, and again, you see right there, hyperconnectivity miniaturization. Uh, so as I mentioned, they're really big on this miniaturizing uh, trend. Next slide. Uh, here's the big news. Um, the company is uh, has a pending acquisition uh, of um, Atotech, which is a chemistry solutions provider. Uh, it's a new area for the company. It is not directly related to what they are doing now, which is is hardware, if you will, related, you know, manufacture, you know, I, I almost said brick and mortar again. I don't know that explains the hardware much more, you know, machinery or gauges, you know, metal, tangible, you know, hard things. And, um, that support the laser and semiconductor industries. Atatech uh, provides chemistries and fluids, cleansing and, and etching fluids and that sort of thing, again, for the same markets. And so they're seeking to um, combine those two companies and it will actually more than double the company in size as we'll see 
in a moment. Next slide. Uh, they're calling this uh, idea of optimize the interconnect. In other words, this graph kind of tries to explain a little bit, uh, both graphically and in some uh, technical detail, how they service some of the same suppliers and they hope to be able to um, blend the expertise and the customer bases together. Next slide. Uh, this, this I'm not going to read it to you, but this is Value Line's um, take on the acquisition, which by and large um, quotes uh, management's outlook. Uh, the Value Line actually, at that when it was published in late December, said that the um, closing was expected by the year end of the year, which was original, but. Uh, because of some uh, continued negotiations with the Chinese regulatory authorities, um, it, uh, the company expects it to close the end of the first quarter of this year. The big key is, as I already mentioned, uh, $3.8 billion in revenue increase. That basically doubles the size of the company, and it will uh, be accretive to the bottom line within the first year. Uh, notice also that none of Value Line's projections nor my projections directly take into account the acquisition yet. Next slide. Um, the key to remember if you say, gee, this is a huge acquisition and it's probably the biggest that company has done, that NKSI has done, but here is their record of successful acquisitions over the last 20 years. It's a key part of their strategy, again, especially since 2016 that is expanding into related areas and uh, so the company knows what they're doing when it comes to acquiring and then implementing or integrating next slide here's just a, a summary slide again on how they believe that they're ready to um, uh, win this miniaturization fight next slide and now the bottom line, almost literally, next slide is completely literally, I'm projecting about a 12% uh, growth rate. Um, uh, the uh, pre-tax profit, profit margins to run about where they are currently, it's a little above the average for the last five years, uh, which leads to a $17 EPS. Next um, slide. And then uh, using a 28 PE, potential return of 23%, and a um, using the average PE of 19 is 14.3%, uh, and that's to be compared to uh, the manifest consensus-based uh, par or average potential return of about 17. There we go. All right. Thanks. Thank you, guys, and uh, I'll double down. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, we'll switch gears and go to electronic payments with Kim. Hello, everybody. Um, I picked PayPal, and since then it's fallen. So the 52-week low is 94.50, and it is starting to climb back up. So the big question is, what happened? Next slide. Um, they had a solid year last year. Um, you look at all of this and you say, oh my goodness, they had a total payment volume of uh, $339 billion, which was 23% on, uh, on spot and uh, FX neutral basis. And, you know, they had total payment volume of uh, $1.25 with a big fat T. That is just amazing. With free cash flow of 5.4 billion, so I'm always talking about I like companies with lots of free cash flow and little debt. And this company is generating more and more free cash flow to fall to the bottom line. If you look at how much debt they have, literally all the debt they have, they could pay it off with the amount of free cash flow they have. Next slide. Um, for the year 2021, um, their net revenues were up 17%, operating income up 30%, earnings per share was down 1%, and that was because they released some funds um, for, uh, oh, crap, I have it here in my notes, but um, 
It was only down 1% and their operating income was 17% earnings per share for non-GAAP was 19%. You have to recognize that PayPal, because of the pandemic had tremendous growth and the stock price got way overvalued. And when it came back down to a reasonable amount, um, the RSI was dropping and it was getting to be reasonable, but then Ultimately, what happened when they had their quarterly um, review, they, they changed some of their guidance. Next slide. And as you can see, one of the things to big circle is their new net active accounts dropped 33%. And if you look at the transcript for the company, they take all the data from every transaction, location, was it the phone, was it the computer, uh, what was the amount? Was this somebody who has used uh, PayPal frequently before? And ultimately from that data, because this is a data-driven company, like a lot of things are anymore, but they recognized they had done some incentivizing to get new members. What they found out was in trying to get those new members, they didn't make a whole lot of money off of them. Because it turns out uh, one third of the clients that they have actually generate the most transactions. And those um, accounts are up to now having 45 transactions per account. So they recognize it's much better to get those members who use PayPal to increase the amount of transactions they have because that's where they get the most return on their investment rather than just getting more members to use PayPal overall. So this statistic made them ultimately, you can see their new accounts have gone down, but their volume went up, revenues were up, their uh, net gap uh, of earnings per share was up 19%, free cash flow is up. I love free cash. It drops the money, drops to the bottom line. The company can do whatever they want to keep growing the company. That's great. And when they're not going to do it, ultimately they'll have dividends. They did pay out um, $3.4 billion to stockholders by buying back shares. So, like I said, they had all that free cash flow that they generated, and they only have debt of $9 billion, so they can pay it off. So all that cash flow is what's really good. And I like the company, I'll admit it. I bought more when it uh, dropped down into the 90s. Um, full disclosure, and I use PayPal myself. Next slide. So why did the stock drop? Well, all investors don't like volatility. And we certainly have had plenty. You talk about the Ukrainian-Russian conflict interest rates are going to rise. We've had the supply chain issues because that is a, that did affect their bottom line with their transactions because with supply chain, they had a hard time getting some of the things that th people wanted to buy. Their tax rate was only 10.5 last year and they feel it's going to be going up in 2022 to 16.8. These are all things that I read in the transcript from the quarterly report. And they changed their guidance because they recognized the change in the data of all these transactions. Their lower, their members who have the lower transactions are not getting that stimulus money. Inflation has gone up 30%, 40%, and they don't have as much free cash around to spend on. So they reduced their revenue growth expectation from 18% to 15 to 17%. Well, the market slammed them hard and dropped the stock price. I think it was another 25 to 30% after they revised their um, estimations of what their uh, guidance was. So truthfully, as investors, we need to love volatility because when we have volatility, we can find those great stocks. We can buy them when they're down. Next slide. Here is the par of um, what PayPal could easily be, um, if you use that lower growth rate of what they're expecting of 15%, their projected, uh, pr projected annual return is going to be 14%. Um, with what's going on with the volatility in the world, in the markets, 
I think a 14% return on your money is going to be really great. Um, it's a sit back and relax for me to watch because I recognize myself, I'm using the product more. I am personally having more transactions. I will admit maybe I'm biased, but I thought all of you should recognize that this is something that you could have in your portfolio and electronic payments are only getting more and more, especially since the pandemic. So I hope you'd consider this for your portfolio. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. All right, here's a newcomer, uh, Victory Capital. Take us away, Matt. Thanks, Mark. So uh, Victory Capital is an investment manager and maybe it might seem uh, uh, slightly um, sacrilegious to bring that here I mean, among a group of individual investors, but I think we can all agree that um, even if you uh, like very much and are good at stock investing, you might still have room, let's say, in um, commodities and bonds and foreign investments for funds and also recognize you know not everyone has the the time or temperament uh, to follow our approach um, so yeah so I was uh, shopping for my groundhog portfolio and found uh, victory capital uh, in a in a few filters um, it is a small company uh, just under a uh, billion dollars in revenue closing in on a billion dollars um, I did end up buying some in January, and it, and it is in my Groundhog portfolio, and, and uh, I've, I've kept it uh, under the radar from the forums uh, for just this occasion, but I did find that uh, uh, there's one other um, entry that also has found it. That's the Space Coast um, uh, Model Club, so I consider that good company. Um, it's funny to say as a small company that's been in operation for 100 years, you start to wonder about its growth, but uh, it has a, a new uh, chapter in life as they had a management buyout from Key Corp, the, the parent company of Key Bank in Cleveland uh, in 2013. And so they were 144 employees with uh, a little over $20 billion assets under management 2013. They've grown to $176 billion uh, today as of, as of the end of last year. They IPO'd in 2018, um, and importantly, uh, they had a dual class structure uh, as part of that management buyout, uh, but they uh, voted to end that structure in, in the fourth quarter of last year, um, hoping to actually be more attractive for the company's stock to be put into indexes. Um, on the right, you can see it's one of the, one of the lists I found, it's, uh, one of the 100 fastest growing companies uh, from Fortune. Ninth overall, first in asset management, and I swear this wasn't a reason why, but it also happens to be first in Texas. That's not bad either. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the uh, key things as a small company you have to keep in mind is is they do grow by acquisition, um, and that's that's really been uh, from the very beginning what they do. You can see on the right they have a number of brands that they work under, and those are uh, prior acquisitions. Their largest by far was uh, USAA Investments, uh, which they bought in 2019. And actually USAA uh, was larger by measured assets under management than uh, Victory was itself. And uh, was so large that they actually moved their headquarters uh, from the Cleveland area down to San Antonio where USAA is. Um, so a majority of their staff is there. Uh, uh, there are a number of other um, brands there and, and assets there. Typically, although they also had West End Advisors, which is out of uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco, at $18 billion assets under management. Um, more typically, they're buying small shops. So you can see they have a couple around a billion or under a billion. For example, um, Sycamore Capital is out of Cincinnati, uh, has 12 investment professionals and uh, uh, specializes in small and mid-cap value stocks. Sophus Capital is an interesting one. They have nine investment professionals with, with offices in Des Moines, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore. You imagine the size of those offices. And again, that's not the whole staff, that's the investment professionals. Um, but, and so on, uh, most of them are more typically that way. And so their acquisition strategy is to uh, find these in very much boutique uh, areas um, or boutique companies and look to acquire them, not to integrate them, but rather to allow them to thrive. So they look for investment autonomy, they keep their teams together, they keep their focus in whatever niche they have, but they give them a centralized operating platform, right? So they, they and rather, and you imagine, um, I mean, a group of, of nine or 12 people is, is, is 
like an average size investment club. Now these are people working on this full time, but you can think of the span of their uh, of their uh, thought processes, um, not just finding investments, but having to manage uh, accounting, having to manage uh, human resources, having to manage regulatory compliance, uh, sales, all those things. So they, they take that burden off, they let them focus on what they do, and then they provide them um, the additional marketplaces to then be. So whether it's being on the list at, on Charles Schwab as a retail broker, introducing them to new in, uh, institutional clients, and of course USAA is a significant um, pool of clients in themselves. So they expand the, the market space for these brands without, uh, without annihilating their own identity. And uh, uh, maybe I'm just looking at them with my green brick glasses on, but I, I think I recognize that kind of operating model as being very attractive for the owners, uh, generally as a partnership with those small companies, to find a way to um, continue to grow but be able to gracefully exit at some point rather than just closing the shop. Next slide. So uh, this is just an overall growth slide. Uh, of course, it's 2018 to 2021 um, because that's their span of, of, uh, of life since the IPO. Um, you can see a lot of the metrics are slower in, in uh, 21 versus 20 versus overall. Of course, they, they hadn't had a, a large, they did have two acquisitions. They didn't have such a large acquisition as they did before, but still at the worst a 15% grower, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, while we have these statistics up, this is a company with a current PE under nine uh, and a yield of three percent. Um, and so uh, we'll we'll look at its growth characteristics, but but given the type of growth they have, given the fact that they're expanding margin, again, uh, very typical for a company that's bringing in revenue, um, grow, not only growing that revenue but lowering the those back office costs, they should be expanding their margin, and they are. Next slide. Uh, so one thing you have to watch when you're managing money is uh, is how you're performing against everyone else. Uh, so the, the upper left is the, the company slide um, showing that 64% uh, of their funds are four or five star rated by Morningstar. Um, with with the niches as varied as they have, and it, so I've included the bottom is actually from Morningstar as of yesterday or as of yeah, yesterday. Um, the top rated and bottom rated ones. I'll tell you when I was shopping in January, um, the bottom was entirely filled uh, by um, funds from their Incore unit. You can see the very bottom ones there. Incore is a debt-focused shop, um, again, one, one of those smaller sized ones. And in addition to, let's say, uh, run-of-the-mill ones, they, they specialize in debt arbitrage. And you can imagine up, and th up through the end of December, uh, the arbitrage opportunity uh, in, in particularly government debt ins instruments that paid you know, between nothing and next to nothing. Uh, there isn't a lot of space between there, and if you were in Europe, you pay. Uh, you, you have to look in between nothing and 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 uh, even less than nothing. Um, but in the in the last month, of course, with uh, with Fed uh, Fed rate hikes, uh, oil shocks, and of course geopolitical events, uh, it's kind of an arbitrageur's field day, and and they've all lifted off. And think about that if you were uh, one of the partners in Incor, right? So they they've been essentially starved of business for the last two years. And uh, a small shop like that may not have survived. So being part of this, this bigger family that allows you to, to do your thing um, and understands that it wasn't your season, uh, but allows you to can you continue on uh, is, is a very big attraction even beyond a purchase price to be part of that family. Next slide. Okay, assets under management, um, kind of the lifeblood. So, so your assets under management can be impacted by a few things. You certainly can sell more shares of your funds, bring in new investors. Um, you, your investments can do well, right? They just, even if nobody bought or sold, you, you could grow. Uh, and then of course, there will be some redemptions, uh, people that go through. And, and the, the only reason that, um, uh, that this stock is, is a potential bargain right now, that it's a $32 stock instead of a $40 plus stock, is because they did have some redemptions in the back half of the year. You can see um, Q2 or Q2 to Q3 is down a little bit incrementally. Um, Q4 is up, but if we go into the next slide, uh, we can see uh, kind of the what, what's going on under the surface. So they did have uh, a number of, of uh, high number of sales in Q4. So sales meaning bringing new investors in, but they also had a, a couple big redemptions. Uh, give me one more click, please, Mark. So in the inset box is some quotes from the uh, 
Q4 conference call. And the explanation for management is that there were two exceptionally large redemptions in October one time in nature. So essentially uh, uh, a few billion um, that were taken out and, and you know, they're not gonna specifically name something, but say, you know, two uh, institutional investors, something like that. Um, so in the point that you're growing, uh, they, they you're, as you're rewarded for growing, in December, the company had hit a speed bump until those were explained. Um, of course, now it isn't going down anymore, but if the company can demonstrate in 2022 that they are growing as they say they were and that those are one time, uh, that should bring things back uh, to their normal uh, PE ratios, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Next slide. So looking at the SSG, and when you look at this chart, and, and uh, those who follow my posts on the forum know that I'm, I'm uh, a data-oriented person. I'm very interested in, in certain data items. Remember that the IPO was in 2018. In this case, you can see that the, the revenue line is actually quite straight. So this is not a case where there's some kind of bad data before the IPO, but simply understand the fact that uh, it was a private company operating, operating differently in that time. Um, uh, they do use, they do have some amount of debt. Um, they use, they generally, when they buy companies, they buy them with debt and then use cash flow to lower the debt. Uh, but in that way, because they don't uh, have significant dilution when they buy those companies, those companies are immediately accretive to earnings. Uh, something certainly is good in a serial acquirer. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll, uh, I'll shorten this down to the life from 2018. Um, excellent company. You do see uh, pre-tax profit and earnings per share growing faster than revenue because again they're they're gaining efficiencies as they're adding these companies not only efficient for the the acquired company but for the overall company as it gets bigger also in this case i added book value per share because when we go to look at the manifest pages um, because this is a financial uh, the the uh, the top lines that what would be the revenue line is book value just to show that book value is roughly in line with revenue growth anyway next page <clears throat> So let's look at that. So this is this is the February 28th uh, manifest investing page. You might wonder why I'm I'm looking. I'm really excited about 11.9 par company. So give me another click. When I was looking at it in January, um, we're looking at a 19 par, and I want to talk a little bit about the difference in those two numbers that are about a month apart. One more click. So uh, book value growth, uh, proxy for revenue growth for financials, is about even if we're uh, drawing with a crayon. Uh, return on equity is up, and therefore earnings per share are going to be up. Uh, the big, the big down arrow I made kind of a wide down arrow was the expectation of the average PE ratio, uh, and I'll address that uh, in the next one. Um, personally, I think 11 is a little high. I think 7.5 is really low, uh, but of course, with a, a lower PE but a higher EPS, then you get a lower projected price. One other thing to note here, if you give me one more click, Mark. The other thing is the EPS stability. So this is not a uh, an 80, uh, 80 percentile or higher high quality company, blue company, or even a 60 green company. I certainly do agree with a quality penalty. It's, it's only had four years of public life. It does need to prove itself. But I think if you look back at the SSGs uh, in, in the pre-IPO years versus the full years, I expect as those early years fall off, uh, the company will easily be able to prove its EPS stability is is higher than being represented here. And again, not that this is bad data, it's all true. Um, it's just a matter of the maturity and the, and the fact that it's a public company now. One more slide. Um, so looking at that average PE, if, if I look at the data raw, and there is kind of a funny thing in 2017, uh, the company had earnings but had no price, so it shows zero uh, PE rather than NMF. Uh, that actually doesn't affect the, the uh, calculations, that's just an oddity. Um, but but raw with four years shows a 9.7 average. Uh, give me another click. If I become a little conservative and take off uh, the highest high and the highest low, I can get down to 8.6. Uh, whether we should do that or not is, is of course, itself an issue. And you notice I have not taken off the 3.5 low in 2020, of course, reached in March of 2020, like so many lows of that year. Um, still uh, quite a bit higher than, than uh, what's before. One more click, please. Uh, if you remember on, on the prior page, the stock page says 7.5. So obviously with such a short history, um, I'd be reluctant to remove any data. Um, 
you can think about what the average might be, but this doesn't have to move much to really move that price uh, on the prior page. Uh, I think it's an excellent opportunity. I think it, uh, something I didn't point out, um, the analyst consensus estimate growth uh, on the SSG right now is only 8%, which would be half of what was done in 2020, uh, which had relatively small um, acquisition activity. Uh, I might say that that's, uh, that might uh, represent uh, organic growth only, um, but really it isn't even that. I, I think that, uh, that the analysts are really low-balling growth expectations. I think the mm -hmm. PE has an opportunity to be higher than, than uh, at least is calculated in the manifest page. And as a, a new company with the risks associated with it, I think this is in an early growth stage and could be uh, a worthy investment for your, for your investigation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Matt. All right, Ken, I've show us about 10 minutes, so if you can uh, squeeze into five or so, and then we'll do her. I only need a couple. So we'll go ahead and take this away with Google. Well, we were sitting at the bull session this afternoon, and uh, Mark brought this screen up. This was a situational screen uh, that we were showing to our people that come to bull session. And uh, we were looking at stocks with, uh, uh, first of all, met the, the, the concept of core. So we were trying to filter out non-core companies and uh, our working definition of a core company is when the quality number plus the financial strength number plus the EPS stability number, these are all manifest numbers now, they're not coming from other sources. When you add those together and get something greater than 225, uh, we're noticing that for the most part, uh, those companies that, that meet that criteria also meet the criteria of being what we call core companies, uh, good uh, companies that uh, we would keep until their par values uh, drop to somewhere around money markets. And uh, I don't know what money market is today, maybe one, one and a quarter percent, uh, but uh, par values haven't dropped that far for these companies. In addition, we wanted it to meet the triple play candidacy, and I'm not going to go into triple play tonight, but uh, I will assure you that these companies meet that, and we said this should be a group of interesting companies. Note the first one on the list. Uh, next slide, Mark. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about this evening, Google. I've presented Google two or three times already in the last couple of years, and the performance has been absolutely wonderful during that time. Uh, it's been a, a, a quiet winner uh, in our portfolio. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth one on the uh, volume list right now as far as percent of portfolio. Uh, most of you know what Google does. Uh, those of you that don't know that Google also owns uh, YouTube and they also have significant forays into a lot of other business, some of it public, some of it kind of uh, a little bit secretive. They call them rocket launches and uh, you don't hear a whole lot about what Google is doing with some of uh, the funds that it has at its disposal. But overall, advertising, YouTube, there's uh, search, uh, and there's there's Google's prime way of making money. Next slide, Mark. Uh, here's the manifest page uh, as of a day or two ago. 21% uh, par, quality of 99. Here's the top of the value line sheet. Uh, you don't see a, a one timeliness and a one safety uh, very often from value line. And when you see a one timeliness and a one safety, that's one of the few times I take into account timeliness at all. Uh, I love the fact that this is considered one of the safest companies you can invest in. And at the same time, they think you're going to make some pretty decent money from it. You see the projections down a little bit beneath that circle Mark just drew at uh, 18, well, 12 to 18 uh, percent. Those are certainly significant numbers when you're talking about annualized return. Next page, Mark. Here's the graph. Uh, you take out 2017 because of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. That was the Trump tax cut. 
and you take it out because Google had to repatriate money and pay tax on it. And so it's not really uh, data that makes any sense. Uh, we'll knock it out of the PEs when we get there as well. So you, you see amazingly consistent growth in sales and in earnings. Uh, the pandemic has only been good uh, to the company. Uh, you notice the extension of the growth. Uh, and you notice over here on the right where the ACE numbers are, analyst consensus estimates, uh, these are uh, Morningstar's uh, numbers going forward. That's a two-year call on sales and a five-year call on earnings. Remember that earnings call of 25% as we go to the next slide. Uh, here's the calls that I made. I called for a five-year growth at 17% for sales. Uh, I put myself on the conservative side of of the analysts that I tend to follow and trust, and that's a, a half dozen standard sources that I use. Uh, I put my historic earnings at 20%, again, on the conservative side of the average of of uh, uh, value line in Morningstar and and a number of other uh, CFRA, uh, Yahoo Finance, and a number of other sources manifest, of course. Uh, down at the bottom, the evaluate management pre-tax profit is, uh, this company is certainly profitable uh, and rightly so. Uh, return on equity is, is good to wonderful. And uh, I know the debt shows red, but uh, debt is, uh, you know, 10% or under, and I think we can live with debt like that. Uh, in Section 3, I told you I was going to knock off the PEs from 2017 uh, because they're impacted by that one-time tax uh, that had to be paid for repatriation. Uh, the other four numbers are clustered tightly enough, however, to give me some pretty good data, and I'm going to use 28.9 for my high uh, PE going forward, my high average and I'm going to use 17. Uh, I noticed the downward trend in those PE values, and I'm going to use 17 for my uh, uh, low average PE going forward. Next slide, Mark. Uh, do the arithmetic, let the machine do the arithmetic, and by golly, it comes out in the buy zone, uh, seven to one upside downside, uh, almost 200% total price appreciation. Next slide, Mark. Uh, and if I sell at the high PE, uh, that was the four-year average, the most recent four-year average. Uh, I stand to make 25%. If I sell at the average PE, and remember I chose 17, a fairly low bar for a fairly high growth company, uh, I choose to make 19%. So, you know, I think of it as a range, uh, 19 to 25%. Uh, that's extremely decent for a medium-sized company or a small company. And this is a gargantuan company. It does not yet pay a dividend. Uh, I'm expecting in the next five years that you might start to see a dividend appear. Uh, Google, uh, uh, throws off all kinds of cash. It has uh, extremely high levels of cash on its books. And at some point, I think it's going to run out of ways to spend it, but it's not there yet. Uh, all in all, I really like this stock. I've presented it three other times uh, for putting it in the portfolio, and I'm presenting it again tonight. Uh, the audience has agreed with me uh, most of the time when I've brought Google to the table. And here's just kind of a tease. It's Google's already made the list from the other times that Ken has selected it. Uh, this is basically what you can do with a thousand dollar positions on certain purchase dates, and it's it's basically a, an interesting chart. Uh, just scratch your head over a little bit. There's some really neat companies on here. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and finish up with Skechers. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because. Today, I was on my way to, or I guess yesterday when Ken called, I needed to bear, buy a pair of shoes. So I went down to the outlet mall and there was Skechers. I bought a set of Skechers shoes and uh, I was very impressed with the service of the people that they had there. They had plenty of staff. They are running a little bit short on my size, but I found this pair that I could live with. 
And so I literally did some footwork for this stock. <laughs> and I got home. God. There, there was a phone call from Ken. Would you be at last night? So I looked at some of my stocks that we had and and the Port of Value Investment Club, which I'm a member, uh, has had Skechers in there for a number of years and has had some pretty good uh, reports on it over the years. And so I thought, well, I could use Haggerty, which is a local company, or I could use NVIDIA. But I thought, no, Skechers seems to fit my price range. And also I'm looking at uh, continuous earnings per share growth, looking at uh, the sales growth in here. And as you can see, it just continues to uh, look very good other than when the uh, when we had the big uh, drop in the virus, uh, they really dropped on their uh, sales and earnings per share, but uh, they've come back on that. So next slide. And they've got Willie Nelson as a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, they have a lot of different sponsors. Yeah, they do. So anyway, they had 1.65 billion record fourth quarter sales. 65% of sales are international, which could be a reason why they had a drop today, but uh, their 30% international wholesale growth. China's 9%, their gross margins are 49%. Direct to consumers are, in which they're trying to increase that, are 30%. Uh, cash and investments, 1.4 billion. Their share repurchase program is the 500 million. They have 3,000 styles and they are in 180 countries and they have 4,300 stores. So that's it's not just a small company. They're really diverse and really stretching out. They're consumer driven, product focused, uh, agile, agile, agile model. They're delivering comfort style, innovation quality at a reasonable price. I did notice that they are now offering more than just shoes. So they do have a lot of apparel too. They have 31 brands, all genders, ranges, and categories. And of course, that fits us 80-year-old along with the 20-year-old. They focus on innovation and quickly adapting products to responsive consumers' trends. So the growing apparel and accessory assortments are growing globally. Uh, their increased focus on environmentally sensitive materials and products and packaging. And when I got bought my shoes, it was in a nice box, but then they put it in a uh, a little like a backpack with a couple of strings on it so I could carry it on my back if I wanted to go shopping to other uh, stores. So that was kind of a nice thing to it. And as you can see, the international wholesale that they continue to grow, uh, they had a drop in 2020, but then they re responded really well. They have a 15% annual comp compounded growth, 30% in sales growth, 44% gross margin, uh, the 2,900 of the stores are third party owned. So it's not all company owned stores, but next, next. So large global base uh, stores in 180 countries, they uh, gain valuable insight consumers trends from our in-store and online test and react programs, meaningful investment in digital infrastructure, consumer loyalty and e-commerce. They are increasing their e-commerce. I did not choose to go to e-commerce because the Skechers store is only one mile away, so I can go over there and check it out. So they, the platform in Canada, India, UK, Germany, Australia, additional in, in Europe, Japan, and South America. Next slide. So it, we've been through this slide here before, and it shows that it's continually growing up in the sales. And as I put the dots in, it's interesting that the earnings per share are, are quite a bit lower than what they are previous. But I'm not sure what the reasoning for that is, but earnings per share growth is 11.2%. Historical sales growth is 15%. So it's continually being a, a strong, strong company here. Next slide. So, and as you can see, they are their pre-tax profit on sales are really growing. They were down a little bit, but they've averaged about 9%. Uh, earned on equity, uh, their had this last year is 25%. Debt to capital is a little bit on the high side, but I think that's a, a margin because they're doing a lot of into the uh, e-commerce on that. So you can see is a 10% growth on there. Next slide. So as you can see here that uh, the uh, uh, average PE is 23.2. The current PE is 10. So in 
they had a closing price on this one of 47. Today it actually closed at $41 and uh, 51 cents. So it's, it really put it into the major buy zone. So it had a 16.8% uh, annualized return. Uh, it is a buy and uh, with, the, with the drop in the price today, I think this is going to be a very good buy for anybody that wants to get into it. And like I say, our port of value has it and I am looking at maybe I should buy some of it tomorrow. <laughs> good, thanks Herb. Plus they're tracking you now with those new shoes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to just make a really quick uh, doubling down. It's actually a ninth thing or tenth thing down on our Delix. And just a quick update, uh, you can go back and, and look at last month's report. It's basically the same situation with one thing, a couple changes. Uh, the $1,000 that goes into it tonight will buy another 1,282 shares, driving the cost basis down under $2. So we will continue to cheer for this company that is trying to develop an innovative cure for dialysis patients. And uh, the only real changes between this month and last month is uh, it, it has kind of calmed down a little bit. The earnings are comparable between the two quarter to quarter. You're also seeing a little bit of a stabilization in the revenue. That's that's really not the story. The part of the story is the fact that uh, uh, the rats are jumping off the sinking boat. You have less analysts following the company as time goes by, and uh, it's an interesting story. Um, cash is basically maintaining. They did, did do some uh, creative uh, financing here lately. Uh, no major changes in the balance sheet for the company. They are pressing forward with their uh, demonstration of an already approved drug that's very closely related to the one that was denied. So they're hopeful that that uh, will get uh, retried. The major reason that I'm sticking with it is the thing that we had hoped would take place as a catalyst was President Biden had nominated a successor to the uh, lead position at the FDA. He's very familiar with the company and he's uh, reportedly a pretty fair guy. Uh, so Ardelix likes their chances on their appeal. This catalyst has fallen into place between last month's roundtable and this one, so it's the it's the major change that uh, you want to at least be aware of. So again, fairly similar situation. The price target has plateaued. Um, if we hit 550 this year, we'll all be quite happy. I do own shares of this company. This is pure speculation, and uh, one of Hugh's favorites over the years. And um, one that's been on quite an excursion. So with that, Ken, let's go ahead and wrap up and uh, go ahead and run the audience poll. Give me just a second here, Mark. Uh... And we did leave our Delics off the poll because we only get five listings and you guys won't vote for mine anyhow, so I'm bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking my ball and going home. Ain't no fair politic and for one of your stocks there. Well, Ken wouldn't even let me list it, Herb. Okay. I well. offered I offered to list it as Alphabet Artilex, Mark. Remember? <laughs> well, that's the coattail effect. Yeah, well, you know, it would be nice to see the sketchers being brought in there. So we'll see. We're getting about 75% uh, of you voting. I'd like to get that up to 85 or so percent. It doesn't take much effort to use your mouse or your finger if you have a touch screen and just, just pick one of them to add to the portfolio. I'm sorry that I can't give you the choice of none of the above this particular time. Well, uh, there, you just pushed it. Either. Let's get two more voting and we can push it right over 90 maybe, huh? Well, we're gonna. I'm gonna close it down at 89% voting, and I'm going to share the results. Okay. Okay. Wow, Google is up there really strong, Ken. Good job. Well, I I, I just think it's a real actionable stock right now, uh, Herb. So we'll we'll see. Uh, all right. That's 39% Alphabet, 22% MKS, 15% Sketcher, 13% PayPal, and 12% Victory Capital. Well, since okay. I, did, I didn't have a dog in this fight, I got to say those five are, are definitely uh, worthy. 
It'll be interesting to see where, where they end up a year from now when we roll out the red carpet again. I all think right. all five were excellent presentations. It gives you something to look at. All right, here's a quick reminder that we do archive these presentations. All roundtables are archived at the on YouTube, which is a Google product um, and service. But under the Manifest Investing page, you can actually just look up the, the roundtables and go back and look at some of the prior ones. All of our bull sessions are also archived, as well as special programs like our successful investing conferences. And uh, that's Best Small Companies presentation I just stuck in there as an insert. We're also experimenting with some quick, uh, snappy shorts on uh, some stocks. So be on the lookout for that. Quickly closing out, we'll have probably a more full schedule uh, a month from now when we get together. We're actually going to get together for the next round table on the 29th of March. Uh, we are continuing to hold the full sessions Tuesdays at 2. So with that, uh, Ken, do you want to close us out? Well, just thanks, everybody, for coming. We appreciate your attendance. And uh, we'll see you again in March on the very last Tuesday of the month. So. Uh, until that time, uh, better investing to everybody. Thank you so much uh, to our guests this evening, Matt Spielman and Kim Butcher and uh, uh, Herb Lemkul. Uh Thanks especially to Cy, who uh, has been a regular here since the beginning. And Mark, uh, we couldn't do any of this without you and your help. Uh, I think we're going to have to come up with a lifetime achievement award for you next year. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't put him up to that folks. So I'll wait, I'll, but I'll make room on the mantle for it. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> So with all that being said, uh, on behalf of the MidMichigan chapter and Manifest Investment, uh, thank you for coming, and we'll see you at the end of March 4th, last Tuesday of the month. I think it's the fifth Tuesday in March this year. Okay. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed Thanks. it. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. We do have a few questions. 